Now the ocean doesn't want me today. But I'll be back tomorrow. The strangers will take me down deep in their bride. Mischievous brain jewels down in the endless blue wine. Open my head and let out all of my time. to go drowning and to stay and to stay but the ocean doesn't want me today Drinking straight vodka. Really fucking gross. You must say goodbye to me. Hello everyone, and welcome to my worst to best on legendary singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and composer, A1 Mr. Tom Waits. Apologies for the delay, but as you'll see on this week's podcast episode, I had filmed this in its entirety and it was ready to edit, and my SD card got corrupted, and I ended up losing everything. Love it. So now, here I am, attempt number two at covering one of my favorite musicians. Pretty self-explanatory what this is. Sarah Schiff from the Jams and Tea podcast already made one of these a little while ago for one of her favorite bands. Uh, check that out in the description below. Uh, but... Some years ago, I actually did this already for uh, two acts. I did it for my favorite band, Porcupine Tree, and one of my favorite artists, Chelsea Wolf. Uh, because we're trying to branch out and make more content, uh, I am going to be remaking those, seeing as some of them have had new releases since I put those videos up, and in other cases, my opinions on certain albums in the discography might have changed a little bit. But first up here, I am going to be talking about one of the most interesting, mysterious, idiosyncratic performers ever to grace the planet. Someone whose music I've actually only gotten into over the last three or so months, but in that time I have been endlessly spinning his records to refine my thoughts and develop an understanding of him and his work. I want to do this just because I like making worst-to-best lists like this, it's a lot of fun, but also I want this to serve as kind of a guide for people seeking to get into Tom and Tom's music, because with an artist as, uh, well, to be blunt, as weird as Tom Waits, it kind of helps to have a guide there with you telling you where you should start and maybe what you should put off. Uh, it's a big catalog. It can be sort of intimidating. So, without further ado, let's go. What's he building in there? Well, We've got to start somewhere, and first up we have Tom's 1977 record, his fourth studio album, Foreign Affairs. Now, if you're the type of person who pays careful attention to things, you have probably picked up on the fact that this is the beginning of this worst to best, meaning that this is, in fact, his worst album. It's a rather uncontroversial choice, as it's easily his lowest rated record on both Sputnik Music and Rate Your Music, so I doubt I'm really upsetting anyone by this placement, but yeah, here we are. And you know, for as not great as this album is, I would certainly hesitate to call it bad. More misguided and thoroughly mediocre, Tom Waits has always been a performance artist as much as a musician, and 
can sort of be divided into eras based on the characters he played in set music. Uh, from the get-go in the 1970s, he was sort of playing the drunken, sad sack barfly character, a hopeless romantic piano player who drowned his sorrows in booze and songs, and I think maybe he got a bit too into character here. The biggest problem this here record has is that Tom literally sounds drunk for every goddamn line of it. He slurs his words, he mumbles, and sometimes he's just near indecipherable. Not that it helps much, seeing as this is pretty boilerplate Waits songwriting, which is admittedly only worse by the merit of Waits being one of the best songwriters to ever live, and just not living up to that title here nearly as well as he does on pretty much every record he's ever made. It's nothing you won't find better on literally every other record from 1970s period Waits, uh, it's not also devoid of genuinely bad moments, as there's a duet with fucking Bette Midler of all people on here, which he has no vocal chemistry with in the slightest. But it's also not devoid of highlights either. You know, even at his worst, Tom couldn't help but sneak a great song or two in there, even at his worst. Notably, the title track and Burma Shave, two must-hear songs for any fan. That said, this is the only record of all 17 that I'm discussing that I would say is wholly inessential, only for completionists, even if it's just mostly mediocre. The gap in quality between this and the rest of his body of work is quite wide, so yeah, definitely do not start here. However, this brings us to... What's he building in there? At number 16, we have Small Change. Don't let its placement here fool you. From here on out, I'd say every Tom Waits record is some shade of great. There's a reason I've devoted half of my listening time the past three months listening to this dude. So yeah, that said, this record is pretty great. Small Change is his third album, and generally seems to be seen by most as an improvement from his first two records, which I have to disagree with. Small Change features moments of Tom's idiosyncrasies that would feature more heavily in his 80s and 90s work, and it's a bit hit or miss as to whether or not they work in and of themselves here. While I applaud Tom for trying to diversify his identity and sound ever so slightly, as a problem I have with his early work is that it all kind of blends together, these attempts here are still kind of scattershot and wouldn't be honed until later down the line. Step Right Up being a prime example of a weird narrative song detour that, unlike later in his career, rings as being overlong, annoying, repetitive, and not particularly engaging in the slightest. That said, this album has some great core tracks from this era that are absolute must-hears. The Piano Has Been Drinking, The One That Got Away, and I Can't Wait To Get Off Work display his songwriting at his most sincere, and even his most catchy, and starts the trend of him speaking from a distinctly lower middle working class kind of voice that made his early stuff rooted in a distinct world and relatability. The album does feature a few cuts that just don't measure up to the rest of his work, but are still good in their own right, like I Wish I Was in New Orleans. But yeah, this is not an artistic high point for Tom, even if it's a solid addition to his catalog. There are worse places to start than here. What's he building in there? Up next at number 15, we have his fifth studio album, 1978's Blue Valentine. As mentioned before, 70s Waits is not my favorite Waits, even if his run of records through this decade was remarkably consistent. Blue Valentine here just sort of embodies the 70s brand very well, and as the name suggests, it's a bit more of a somber record than the few ones that preceded it, barring maybe only closing time. Blue Valentine's biggest problem is that it's not unlike Small Change, it's just sort of an uneven album. It is, however, devoid of the occasional pointless detours, and the highlights here have always struck me as being a bit higher. His cover of Somewhere is a phenomenal opener, and Christmas Card from a Hooker in Minneapolis is one of the best narrative songs he's got. The real standout here is one of his best songs, and that comes in the form of Kentucky Avenue. 
And when I say best, I do mean it. Tom has multiple contenders for the title of best song ever written, and generally speaking, has at least one of them on nearly every single album. So I don't exactly say this lightly, considering the standard he's built for himself. Kentucky Avenue is a beautifully mournful track that's impressionist storytelling not only makes it an engaging experience that's always interesting to revisit, but foreshadows a lot of his songwriting in the future in terms of style and general poeticism. Lou Valentine has no bad songs. You'd be surprised how few of those weights actually has as a whole. Only really middling ones on here, and they generally don't have a particularly unique vibe amongst its peers, but it's still a great record in its own right, just maybe not the most definitive. What's he building in there? Next up, we have Heart Attack and Vine. And this is sort of a difficult album to talk about, as its placement here signifies that I do think it's better than what came before it, but really the gap between this and Blue Valentine just isn't all that wide. I'd chalk it up mostly to consistency. It's less uneven, and it has more of a defined sound, but in terms of 70s weights, there's really nothing about the record that stands out. It is indicative of the era a little bit more sonically, even if it does lean into being a bit jazzier, not entirely unlike things like The Heart of Saturday Night, but his personality isn't as on display here. If I sound like I have more nice things to say about the records that came before it, it's because they had very obvious strengths and weaknesses. Like I mentioned earlier, this particular era of his career, while good and very consistent, is not full of variety. It's a refinement sound-wise, and his songwriting is still top-notch, but its identity is mostly restricted to being the last few albums, but a little bit better. What's he building in there? Now we finally get to talk about something a little further down the line. Frank's Wild Years is an album that follows a monolithic one-two punch that came in the form of Swordfish Trombones and Rain Dogs, two of his most celebrated records. This was also the last record he made before a small break Waits took from studio work and reinvented himself with Bone Machine coming back in the 90s. And as a result, this album often gets forgotten seeing as it's stuck between more beloved records, even if it still does have a good reputation. Most notably, this album has the original version of the theme song from The Wire, which is definitely one of the better cuts here. Frank's Wild Years is an interesting album because, in terms of pure content, songwriting, theme, character-wise, it's harkening back to his 70s stuff, as he's playing a character who seems to be a near-do-well, drunken party-goer who is a slave to his vices, so it's a little bit more hedonistic than before. The other thing that separates it from its 70s stuff is that the production and the actual music here is a bit more in line with the experimental ventures on his previous two albums. There's more of a through-line narrative with this one, and persona-wise Tom adopts kind of a drunken Frank Sinatra type to his delivery, but he bounces back and forth between his more animated and drunkard characteristics. It's a fascinating moment in his career as a milestone, but sadly, it does suffer from being both a little too long and just not as incredible as what it was sandwiched between. Some of the ideas he plays with, like on Swordfish Trombones, feel a little haphazard and clash with the more traditional songwriting here, but it's not often enough to the point where it's significant. It also does suffer, for me anyway, in that he later makes a record that combined these two separate eras of his work, but to much more successful results, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Don't let this placement here fool you. It's a damn good record, and it's a shame that no one talks about it like the previous two, but I can regrettably see why that is the case. What's he building in there? Now we have arrived back at the 70s again, but thankfully I can do this with a little bit more enthusiasm. Heart of Saturday Night is an album that feels very alive, as it's aptly named. Tom is always focused on the underbelly of society and communities, and the city nightlife feels in full force here, like closing time with a bit more scope. His performance is, however, immediately more animated and theatrical, but it's never overbearing considering the music itself is a bit more lively and animated, and more jazz-infused. For a sophomore album, it's kind of the antithesis of a slump as it builds on ideas that came before it, even if I deem Closing Time to be the more consistent and holistic record with bigger highlights. 
Tom is channeling Billy Joel and Bruce Springsteen pretty fiercely here, and it's a surprisingly good fit for him. Basically, it's everything a second record should be, and I do return to it frequently because this brand of lively nocturnal energy isn't really found elsewhere in his music, or in music in general. It's definitely worth checking out, and as a place to start, I would highly recommend it. What's he building in there? So, as you may have noticed, at least you more savvy viewers, Tom has 16 studio albums, but I've numbered this as being 17 albums. And I'm not counting live albums like Nighthawks, so what we have here is actually more of a compilation. Orphans, Ballers, Brawlers, and Bastards is a triple album divided into three sections to cover specific moods and styles that Tom focuses on through his entire career. Ballers being the sad, dirge-heavy ballads, Brawlers being aggressive and punchy songs that have a bit more swing to them, and Bastards, which are his weirder, more experimental narrative stuff. Now, this may mostly be a compilation of b-sides and songs he wrote and totally independently of other albums, as well as the odd cover here and there, but the actual quality of the music here is outstanding. The reason I include this is because I think this is mandatory listening for fans, as it's a shitload of material that is remarkably consistent. This is three hours of music that has no significant slumps whatsoever, save for the occasional too weird for their own good tracks like King Kong, so it's hard not to include something like this. With the way I'm talking about it, you might be wondering why it's not a little bit higher on this list, and the reason for that is twofold. One, his other shit is literally just that good. Two, being that while the music is quality, there's no overarching theme or identity here. It is, in fact, a compilation. And even though it's a great one, I can't in good conscience say it's an experience on par with the more unified works of his. Still, absolutely incredible stuff on here that all fans should check out. What's he building in there? And now, the top 10. At last. From here on out, every single album remains consistent and should be considered upper-tier Tom Waits. I am partially saying this to cushion the blow here, seeing as Swordfish Trombones is a record that is often considered to be one of his best, if not his best in general. I would say the record here has earned its reputation, but suffers mostly through Tom's growth as an artist yielding him more benefits down the line. Here is when we finally see his eclectic and eccentric sensibilities in full force, and to just come out swinging like this is super commendable. However, I think it does show that this record is his first attempt at being weirder and more challenging. His instrumental tracks aren't nearly as compelling or diverse or layered as they'd be later on down the line, and there's one too many of them on here. The production itself isn't as gopher broke as it is on something like Bone Machine or even Blood Money, so sometimes the clanky awkwardness is more to his detriment than his benefit. All that said, it's an atmospheric record that contains plenty of memorable material. It takes a few listens to truly warm to, at least it did with me, but it's odd, off-kilter performances, weirdly and somber and strange songwriting and general vibe are pretty addictive and fun to come back to. And it's not devoid of more classic and heartfelt cuts like In the Neighborhood, totally one of his best songs. Even the opener, Underground, is a deceptively simple, stripped-back song that sets the tone for the album really, really well. It's a great record, for sure. And in my eyes, it was the blueprint for what was to come for the second half of his discography, essential to learning about his progression as an artist. If, however, you don't really generally vibe with his earlier stuff that's easily for most people to warm to, give this a shot and see if its strangeness appeals to you, because, well, it has that quality in spades. What's he building in there? Closing Time. Closing Time is Tom's debut record, and really, I think it's one of the best debut records of all time, really. It's a very focused project, and some of his most popular and beloved songs are on here, and thus it's probably the easiest album of his to get into. If you want to start somewhere, this is most commonly what I would refer to you, as it's where I started. 
The music here is a bit more traditional and accessible without sacrificing any of the quality. It sort of embodies my issues with 70s weights in that he just sort of perfected it out of the gate here and only truly built upon it in the following album where a slightly different vibe was achieved. These songs are consistently downbeat and heartbreaking, lots of regret and themes of lost youth and past mistakes coming around to haunt you. It makes for an unusually identifiable listen that's very low-key, very piano man at a bar at midnight kind of vibe, and it feels very earnest, very devoid of theatricality, likely making it his most personal sounding record. It's a strong debut that, while not exactly containing variety, is remarkably consistent and one of his easiest records to just throw on and enjoy. What's he building in there? Immediately after his first album, we discuss his last album, Bad As Me. Tom really hasn't lost his passion, energy, or desire to push boundaries, even at his old age, as the gap between this and Real Gone is his longest between studio releases. I wouldn't call this a holistic or terribly unified album, but I would call it quite diverse, very entertaining, and generally it serves as a wonderful swan song if this does end up being his last record as Tom has something for everybody here. Lonesome ballads, experimental ragers, hellish aggressive cuts to make you feel like you've fallen into the world of a madman. The gang is all here. In fact, it serves more of a greatest hits of Tom Waits' purpose. It's just that they're new songs. They're not greatest hits. Are there any new ideas on here? No, not particularly, but going the safer route was smart considering how much of his own career he's effectively paying homage to, with a great crop of songs that have no real identifiable weak point, and shout out to Hell Broke Loose, which is a absolute hell demon spawn dragon monster of a song that's just... It is incredible that Tom is making music that sounds this fucking out there at his age. Definitely an emblematic uh, sign of how passionate he was, even towards the end. What's he building in there? At number seven, we have Alice. Alice is one of two albums based on plays that Tom co-wrote with William S. Burroughs. Thankfully, the music from both records can be enjoyed on their own, and both make for a great time, and an excuse for Tom to pursue some of his stranger corners of his sound. Alice here is very sad, it's lower energy, and it's an album with occasional bursts of life, but generally I think this is more comparable to something like an early Nick Cave record if the production was a bit crazier. When I talked about an album earlier when I was discussing Frank's Wild Years about something that combined his 90s sound and his sort of 70s structure and aesthetic to more consistent results, this is the album I was talking about as it feels a lot more like Frank's Wild Years seen through the lens of Mule Variations, uh, the album I'd say that this is most similar to. It's a very dreamy, decidedly more downbeat album that really grows on you. Uh, it fills out a niche of his work that was during a period where being loud and chaotic was kind of his modus operandi, so it's nice to see something that's a little bit more restrained come through from such a wild era even though it does have its moments and they kind of stick out like a sore thumb on here a little bit more than other times, but overall it's a very minor flaw that I'm willing to forgive as this contains some of his absolute best songwriting. Uh, a definite essential listen as this is a less talked about 90s record uh, that definitely deserves a lot more love, just because it's less energy than something like Bone Machine doesn't mean it deserves to be ignored, not by a long shot. What's he building in there? At number six, we have Blood Money. Blood Money is a filthy, lurid record that feels like watching a rated R movie you weren't allowed to be watching as a kid. Tom is at his most cartoonish, monstrous, and nihilistic here as we explore the world of gamblers, spies, thieves, traitors, liars, and cheaters that showcase maybe the darkest display of humanity that he's painted outside of Bone Machine. 
If Blood Money was a movie, it would be directed by Josh and Benny Safdie, and it would be a loud, chaotic punch to the face that's completely relentless. The overpowering darkness of the songs on here, like Misery's The River of the World, show a deeply cynical viewpoint that isn't really wholly typical of Waits, as even in his most grim, he shows mankind's softer, more sensitive side as being sort of a a refuge uh, amidst all of the chaos and turmoil. Here, there is no such softer side to be found. It is pure, uncompromising darkness. And in his 90s run, this aesthetic fits it very, very well. One of his shorter records, South of an Hour, um, and I kind of prefer it that way, just because uh, I feel like too much of it would have probably been a bit overbearing, but as is, it's perfectly sized. Uh, it's very, very cartoonish, and sometimes I feel like people might not get as into that side of, of the record, even in comparison to things like real variations, but if you're willing to go with it, it's a pretty enjoyable ride. What's he building in there? And now we have the top five. And on the edge of the top five, we have The Black Rider. I'll be the first to admit, I definitely like this record a hell of a lot more than most people. If Foreign Affairs is pretty universally considered his weakest entry, then The Black Rider here is more commonly considered his second worst. Uh, it's the other uh, album of his that was uh, the music from a play that he co-wrote with William S. Burroughs, which is The Black Rider, you know, title, duh. Uh, but The Black Rider is a play that is partially inspired by the real-life death of William S. Burroughs' wife, who he accidentally shot and killed while trying to reenact the William Tell myth. Can I get a yikes? But yeah. The Black Rider here is definitely a narrative story, and I won't lie, you need to know some of the details of the plot to truly follow the narrative here, but all this said, what I like about The Black Rider is that, as a whole, it is a complete descent, a journey into this hellish carnival setting that he paints so flawlessly with some of his most weird, experimental, and out-there production. Uh, that just absolutely goes for broke. Um, there are instrumentals here, the most of any record he has, just because it is music from the play, uh, but they are all consistently super compelling. Songs like Russian Dance and the Black Box theme are very weird and make you feel like you're in some bizarre episode of The Twilight Zone. Each song has a very animated, cartoonish performance from Tom as he embodies dozens of different characters of people from this carnival who lament their sorrows and woes through song. And then there are just detours and songs like Oily Night, which are just fucking weird, but everything serves to paint a very vivid mental picture. Uh, a weakness this has is that there aren't really lots of singular songs here that I think are like meant to be taken on their own. This is an album that you should digest all at once. There are songs you can come back to, such as Flashpan Hunter, or uh, November, or even I'll Shoot the Moon, uh, but that said, it is more of a holistic experience and it deserves to be enjoyed in that manner. Um, if this was a list that was more geared towards my personal preferences, it might have landed a spot higher. Uh, but as is, I really, really do enjoy this album, and it is a shame that it is overlooked by so many people, as it is one of the least rated of his albums at all. And don't worry, I get it, this is not an album for everybody. But if you're willing to go with it, and you just really like this particular vibe like me, and you're into this weird phantasmagoria, then it's definitely worth exploring. It is one of the most pleasant surprises I've had with a series of albums going from Bone Machine directly to this. So yeah, definitely check this one out, but proceed with caution. It's pretty inaccessible, but with Tom, at some point, you just gotta go with it. What's he building in there? 
Moving along the top five, at number four, we have Mule Variations. Uh, Mule Variations is a very stark record. It opens with the very boisterous and loud Big in Japan, which is a, a great single, a very popular and hooky song. But Mule Variations, for the most part, has the vibe of a, a, a play set during the Great Depression, I'd say. It's very rural America, as the title sort of implies, but this is a very downbeat record, but it's also a record rooted in fear and in longing. There's a spoken word passage that Tom indulges in more in his 90s run that I do really enjoy uh, as he sort of uses these spoken word pieces to set the tone for parts of the album. and. What's he building in there is on this record, which is probably my favorite, uh, maybe rivaled by only other one that I haven't talked about. Um, but that said, Meal Variations is maybe the most quintessential of his 90s albums. It has pretty much everything you might want to look for. It is super holistic, a very, very cohesive listen that, despite going north of an hour, absolutely flies by. It has something for everybody, but I really think the distinct strength of this record is in Tom's versatility when it comes to performances. There's lots of subtle differences, there are lots of different uh, vocal patterns or, or uh, different impediments that he'll imply uh, through his speech in order to more perfectly inhabit these characters that he's singing from the point of view of. Uh, and it leads to a weirdly introspective album that has many, many contemplative moments uh, and songs that I do think are in the vein of things like Kentucky Avenue that are super impressionistic. It's a very, very dark release. Uh, not quite nihilistic to the level of blood money, but to the point where this feels like one of a darker version of a Coen Brothers movie, which is apt seeing as Tom Waits literally was in a Coen Brothers movie, so, you know, it's appropriate. But Meal Variations is an absolute must-listen. I would easily recommend this to most people who I think would be geared towards the more experimental sounds that he indulged in later in his career, uh, maybe above all others. It takes a bit getting used to and acclimating yourself if this is your first record of his, uh, but upon re-listen, I found myself enjoying it more and more each time, which thankfully is a prevailing trend with his better albums. What's he building in there? And now, the top three. And at number three, we have Bone Machine, his comeback record in the beginning of what is my favorite era of Tom Waits, and boy howdy, did we begin with a bang. Uh, like Closing Time, I think it's funny that the album he uses to start off a particular era of his defined sound is so fully formed and out there and mostly perfect. Bone Machine is a rickety, clanking, ramshackle album that is... it sounds like it's made from clanging bones and metal scraps together and somehow finds the beauty in this very stripped-back approach. Bone Machine is an album that is apocalyptic. It's not devoid of things like humor and stuff. In fact, it's sort of employed in a very ironically detached, cruel kind of way. Uh, but just the world we get a look into here, from the opening track, The Earth Died Screaming, it's just so stark, it's just so bleak, and it ends up being a very dark entry in his discography, and that's saying something considering most of his albums are, as I've said, pretty fucking dark. Uh, the atmosphere is tangible, palpable on this record, and the fact that he does so much with so little speaks volumes to his talent. Uh, he's got songs like Murder in the Red Barn, which play around with that impressionist storytelling that give you all these hints that let you piece things together and sort of come at this song a different way each time. You have more political songs like the Colosseum that just sort of explore the random and pointless nature of human conflict. And you have songs like All Stripped Down, which are just weird ventures that he goes off on that, you know, shouldn't work and are weird, but 
in a very odd way, it all comes together to form a very, very clear picture. But I think what keeps coming back to Bone Machine is that there is sort of a heart at the end of it all, that there's this apocalyptic wasteland that this is all set in, but there is a humanity that is prevailing and surviving that I think is emblematic of Tom's approach to writing and fiction and storytelling across his entire career, really, not just here. And this also contains uh, I Don't Want to Grow Up, which might very well be his best song, as it is a very fast-paced and energetic song that talks about not wanting to grow up and seeing all of the fears and horrors of adulthood through the eyes of a child, but as Tom's raspy older man delivery makes this song sound upbeat but also weirdly tragic, as if he hasn't been able to escape adulthood and all of the things that come with it, and as somebody who was, you know, terrified of adulthood as a child, I identify with that a lot. But yeah, this is a very acclaimed release, one of, considered one of his best, and rightfully so. Bone Machine is a essential listen for fans of weirder alternative music from this particular era, and it is definitely one of Tom's best releases. What's he building in there? Coming in at number two, we have, of course, the lauded, the legendary, the loved Rain Dogs. Rain Dogs is the album that is most likely to place at the very, very tip-top of your Tom Waits ranking, whoever you may be, as it's generally just agreed upon as being his best album, or just one of the best albums of all time. And I gotta admit, the hype is deserved. This was actually the first Tom Waits record I listened to, but I only got in three songs just because I didn't really know what to expect with him. I just sort of dived into this album because it was his most beloved, and it was a bit too weird for my liking. So again, this is a better album. Uh, to explore once you have a better idea of what he is all about. Uh, as the opening, Singapore, which is a very animated and kind of ghoulish uh, and just frankly kind of silly performance, uh, is kind of off-putting if you don't know what to expect. It's incredible the leap here, I think, that was made between uh, Swordfish tram Trombones and this, as this album has the feeling of a drunken knight out on the town with a bunch of pirates and sailors, and encountering a bunch of colorful characters whose life story you find out all about. And it's got this warmness to it, this, this richness of this camaraderie and a sense of friendship, even though it begins to explore dark and weird places, it's still a very upbeat record. It feels like attending a party that you weren't supposed to get to go to, and it has a very nocturnal feel to it that I find so engaging and exciting. Some of his songwriting, too, is just absolutely pitch-perfect. Time, one of his best ballads, and one of the best written songs ever made, in my opinion. Rain Dogs is an album with a legendary reputation that it has earned every single bit of. Uh, maybe not a perfect record, just because some occasional moments can sound a little tiny bit dated, uh, but even in dating it, it still feels weirdly timeless. Uh, it has something for everyone. It would even cover things that he did later on in his 90s run, uh, but is very still quintessentially of this part of Tom's career. Um, definitely one you need to go in with a bit more of an open mind to, but it's joyous and celebratory, and it feels so all-encompassing, and I can't help but be impressed by it. It's just a thoroughly soulful album that I have a wonderful, wonderful time with. It's definitely an outlier in terms of, like, vibe and mood and just overall construction, uh, but it is one of his more fully realized visions. Uh, unlike The Black Rider, I feel like this is a very, um, vivid narrative that you don't need all of the details of, as his songwriting is, like, it just perfectly balances along the edge of a razor here, and ends up being one of the most fun and entertaining records you are likely to hear in any genre, honestly. So, that said, what is my number one? Well... What's he building in there? 
At last, we have arrived at the number one spot, and honestly, if you've been paying attention to the podcast or saw my vinyl video, you definitely saw this coming. Yeah, my number one record is the one that I bought on vinyl and constantly said was amazing. Wow. Yeah, real shocker. Real Gone isn't exactly a popular record in Waits' canon, and I attribute that to its time of release. As of now, it's his second to last album, being released in 2004, right after the tail end of his acclaimed 90s run. The musical landscape just grew past Tom, and it didn't help that Real Gone here was such a hard right turn of an album. Real Gone is a grimy, loud, lurid, chaotic, and ramshackle album even by Tom's standards, like a hell-spawn combination of Blood Money and Bone Machine. It's worth noting that there are two distinct versions of this record, the remastered version and the original. The original has an absolutely filthy lo-fi mix with a lot of grime and white noise put into the production that makes it feel hardly produced at all, whereas the remaster cleans up some of this so a lot of the instrumentation is just cleaner. I recommend both just to see what your preference is, as many people do prefer the grimier mix but I am in the camp that the remaster here is the better version. Real Gone, even remastered, is still a plenty noisy record, and I like being able to appreciate the dense levels of instrumentation brought to the table here. Whether it's the pirate rager of Hoist That Rag or the surreal nightlife exploration of Metropolitan Glide, there's a lot to take in here, and it's best enjoyed when you can hear it as clearly as possible. At least, if you ask me anyway. Real Gone, in a lot of ways, feels like the logical progression of his 90s work. His sound pushed to its absolute extreme, and nothing else. That's not to say it's not devoid of the more somber Waits ballads, as we've got songs like Dead and Lovely and The Day After Tomorrow that accentuate his strength in storytelling and his more sad, bluesy, folky roots. We've also got little experiments like Circus, Shake It, Clang Boom Steam, and Chickaboom, that are just weights at his most unhinged and experimental, leaning into beatboxing and the stuff that he did occasionally on albums like Mule Variations. And as high as the high points are with the out there stuff on this record, his more traditional stuff is also at its very best. You have the fantastic nine minute long ballad of Sins of My Father, which is structured perfectly to warrant the length. You've also got Trampled Rose, Green Grass, and Baby Gonna Leave Me, which is just classic waves through and through, but with the lens of this album's distinct sound. It's disorienting and odd one moment, and heartfelt and sincere the next. And that sort of balance and whiplash is exactly what I come to Tom for. It's a record that fires on all cylinders, and as a result, it consistently remains exciting, even when it's mellow. I don't think there's a weak cut here, personally. Not his most beloved record, but probably his most underrated, and obviously, in my opinion, his best. I hope you all enjoyed this worst to best of Mr. Tom Waits. Please, by all means, comment below, let me know what your personal ranking of Tom Waits' albums are, as he has many of them, and they are all quite good, so who knows what your ranking will end up looking like. And I hope maybe that if you didn't know who Tom Waits was or were looking to get into his music, I may have given you a decent place to start, catered to your specific sensibilities. But also, tell us what other worst of us you would like to see so that maybe we can contemplate making them, as we do have five people working on content for the channel, so who knows. But for the time being, worst to best, Tom Waits... I don't know how to end the video. I'm a fucking loser. I'm gonna die alone. Oh, is that right?